So this is uh, the kingdom of God is like, this is the first lesson uh, in this uh, series. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the uh, very contentious and emotional and at times violent presidential election uh, taking place in our, in our nation. Uh, no matter uh, you know, what our political perspective is, however, uh, we should be grateful that we still have you know, the freedom to vote and to voice uh, an opinion about our government unlike other places. You know, I wouldn't want to be in Cuba or in China. They, don't, they, they kind of vote, but usually the government only gives them one choice. Uh, but here in the United States, we still have a choice. We still have a, a chance to influence the elections. Now, I'm saying all of this uh, to remind us as Christians, uh, we need to remember not only to participate in the government of this nation, but also remember that we belong to a government of another world. Uh, just in case you were afraid I was going to start talking about politics, I'm not. I just want to make the point that we live in the world where government is important and we have to participate in government. But we, you and I, uh, who are Christians, we also belong to another government that is not of this world. And that's uh, what I want to talk to you about. Um, this government is referred to as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom uh, of God uh, here on earth. Now, uh, Jesus explained the duality of our situation. When I say our, I mean Christians. The duality of our situation when he answered Pilate concerning his true identity and he answered him that he was the king of another kingdom or another government. We read about that in John uh, chapter 18. It says, therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So in this first lesson, I, I want to talk about the kingdom of God, this government that we belong to that is present in this world and will continue to exist in the world to come, when this earthly world will no, longer, will no longer be. And so one of the first things I want you to understand about the kingdom is the following. The kingdom was the subject of prophecy. The kingdom was subject uh, of uh, prophecy. This prophecy primarily uh, is contained in uh, the book of Daniel chapter two. We'll read about that a little later on. The government of the United States, for example, has been around you know, for 200 years or more, and it rules over a vast nation with millions of citizens. However, no one in the distant past predicted accurately that the United States would one day be a nation. No one ever predicted or prophesied about the uh, uh, United States as a country. All right, there's no prophecy about the United States uh, coming into existence. But the kingdom of God, however, uh, was a subject of prophecy centuries before it was realized here on earth. And as previously mentioned, was spoken of in the book of Daniel some 600 years before it arrived. I myself find that amazing. I mean, here we, we uh, you know, you and I and other Christians, we belong to the kingdom of God and we talk about it and so on and so forth, but we forget uh, how amazing it is that 600 years before it arrived, there was a prophet who described exactly uh, when and, and where and what the kingdom uh, would be like. And so uh, I want to talk a little bit about Daniel, the one who made the prophecy that I'm talking about. I think you're familiar with Daniel, but I'll just do a little review here. We know that he and other young Jewish men of noble blood were carried off into Babylonian captivity, uh, where by the grace of God and their faithfulness to, uh, to him in trying circumstances, 
these young men were raised to high levels in the court of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Soon after Daniel was called upon, one of the young men, Daniel, he was called upon to interpret a strange and disturbing dream that the king experienced. And within his interpretation of this dream, God revealed the sweep of history that was to come as well as a historical marker for the arrival and the development of God's kingdom here on earth. So God used Daniel some 600 years before the arrival of the kingdom to not only announce the arrival of the kingdom, but to also describe all the things that would take place uh, take place in history leading up uh, to the arrival of the kingdom. So Daniel's inspired interpretation of this dream is recorded in Daniel chapter 2, 31 to 44, and its accuracy concerning future earthly kingdoms has been established as history has unfolded. So let's read uh, Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31. It says, you, O king, and now here's Daniel, he's speaking to the king about his dream. He says, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and uh, crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now I want you to note that the miracle here is twofold. First, Daniel describes the dream without any help from the king who kept the matter of his dream a secret as a way of testing the legitimacy of any of the prophets or magicians that tried to interpret his dream. So that was the first miracle. And the second one was that Daniel accurately describes the rise and fall of four world empires in correct succession over a period of six centuries into the future. And if you want to carry this forward to today, that's 26 centuries. Uh, where his prophecy has been, has been accurate. So let's examine his interpretation just a little more closely, shall we? Note, first of all, um, that the statue in the dream is made of many parts. The head is made of gold, the breast and the arms silver, the belly and thigh uh, bronze, and the legs and feet of uh, iron and iron mixed with clay. Now in the dream, a stone cut without human hands appears and strikes the statue, not on the head, but on the feet of iron and clay, reducing the entire statue to dust, which is blown away. Uh, and in its place, the stone becomes a mountain that fills uh, the earth. So let's continue reading Daniel chapter two verse 36 and seven, as he interprets this dream, he says, this was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold, after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule all over the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. 
As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with uh, pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation trustworthy. And so in his interpretation, Daniel describes five separate kingdoms. The first one is the Babylonian empire. That's the head of gold. This was a fitting symbol because Babylon was the finest of the ancient kingdoms lasting over a hundred years. They went from 625 to 539 BC. The second kingdom he describes is the Medo-Persian empire, the breast of silver with the two arms. Daniel mentions two arms, which describes the dual nature of this empire that was ruled by the combined might of the Medes and the Persian kingdoms. Uh, they were noted for their great wealth, seen in the abundance of silver coinage in their kingdom. And they went from 539 to 331 uh, BC. The third kingdom he describes is the Greek empire. The belly and the hips of brass represent them. Alexander the Great defeated the last of the Medo-Persian kings, Darius III, in 330 BC. The Greeks innovated the arms of war by using brass armor as protection. Greece was defeated and then absorbed by Rome in 146. And so they went from 330 to 146 BC. And then the fourth kingdom he talks about is the Roman Empire, the legs of iron, with the feet of clay mixed uh, with uh, iron. Now, uh, iron, because the Romans innovated the use of this particular metal in warfare. As it grew, Rome would make alliances with foreign kings, which ultimately weakened its empire and was a factor in its demise. In 476 AD, when Romulus, the last of the Roman empires, was overthrown by the German leader Odoacer, uh, and Odoacer became the first barbarian to rule in Rome. So note that all of these kingdoms, these four here, all succeeded each other in history. And Daniel correctly described their appearance and their demise in the proper order, doing so in the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Well, then we have the fifth uh, kingdom that he talks about, and that is, of course, the kingdom of God. That's the stone, begins with a stone cut without hands and then grows uh, to be a, a whole mountain that fills the earth. So note carefully what Daniel says about this fifth kingdom appearing as a stone that grows into a mountain. First of all, it's time of appearance. When does it appear in history? Well, it appears during the period of the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire. Then he talks about the place of its appearance, and that is at the feet of the statue, not the head, which in context of the Roman Empire would have been the city of Rome itself, which was the target of all its earthly enemies. I mean, you think of you know, David and Goliath. Did David you know, throw the stone at, at Goliath's feet? Well, of course not, you know, he aimed for the head to try to you know, take out the, uh, the, the giant. And so any attack uh, to try to overpower the Roman Empire would naturally be against Rome, which was the seat of, of power and government and wealth and so on and so forth. But the stone uh, that Daniel talks about does not uh, is, uh, you know, attack the head. The stone strikes the feet of the target. And so the feet represented the outlying provinces. Uh, at first, you know, the Romans, you know, they would simply overrun a country and take it over and rule it you know, by force. 
Eventually, as it grew out, outwards, uh, the Romans would then make alliances. You know, the deal was, look, we won't overrun your country, we won't burn you down, but uh, you will come under the Roman you know, orbit and you'll pay taxes to us. And if you agree to that, well, then we'll leave you alone. You know, we'll, we'll send one of our governors and that'll be it. Well, they made many of these types of alliances and Judah was one of those things. So note that unlike these other kingdoms, Daniel, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, unlike these uh, um, uh, other attacks you know, against Rome, against the, uh, uh, the city of Rome, this attack went to the feet, which represented the outlying provinces like Judea, which I mentioned, and what's important, uh, Judea is the place where Jesus ministered and established his church. Uh, number three, the, the type of kingdom uh, that Daniel describes. The stone cut without hands is a way of denoting that this would be a supernatural kingdom, not a temporal one like uh, those before it. Note also that unlike these other kingdoms, Daniel states that this fifth one will be established by God, Daniel chapter two, verse 44. And then he talks about the duration of this kingdom because he's spoken of the duration of all the other kingdoms. You know, this will be one kingdom, it'll be replaced by another, it'll be replaced by another. But when he talks about the fifth kingdom, he doesn't talk about any replacement, okay? The other kingdoms had periods of glory and power lasting centuries. But Daniel says that the fifth kingdom will be everlasting. It will never fail. The image of the stone growing into a mountain filling the earth symbolizes a kingdom that will dominate every other kingdom. Therefore, some 600 years before Christ, a Jewish prophet spoke of four kingdoms that would rise and fall until a fifth one would be established that would dominate the world and last forever. So for six centuries, the Jewish people waited for this kingdom. They prophesied, excuse me, this kingdom that had been prophesied by Daniel. For six centuries, the Jewish people waited for this event to take place. And then one day, a prophet in the spirit of Elijah proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew chapter three, Verse three, can, can we understand then why John the Baptist's preaching caused so much excitement among the people? I mean, they could read, they knew the contents of the Old Testament, they knew about the four kingdoms and they knew they were living in the fourth kingdom. And if they knew this, they also knew that, boy, that fifth kingdom would be arriving somewhat around this time and now you have a prophet coming out and saying the kingdom, you know, the kingdom is coming, get ready for it. And so in speaking of the kingdom that is not of this world, we note first that this kingdom was spoken of in prophecy, which has since been confirmed by history. Okay, another feature of the, the kingdom that we as Christians belong to is that uh, this kingdom of God is on earth, but is spiritual in nature. Now Daniel predicted that the kingdom was to come and John the Baptist preached that it was at hand and then Jesus proclaimed that it was here. And so for Jews who had actually lived through the four empires uh, mentioned by Daniel, this was exciting news. For some, it rekindled nationalistic aspirations that had appeared throughout their history. Now, I need to understand some of the thinking uh, that the Jews had uh, at the time concerning the kingdom. We have one idea of it, and hopefully after this series of lessons, we'll even have a better idea of it, but the Jews had a different idea of them. One such idea was the Davidic concept of the kingdom. Their hope, uh, according to the Davidic concept, was that God would send a king like David who would lead them out of bondage and regain their lost territories. They believed that the day of the Lord was to be a time when the nation would be restored. Uh, we read about that in Amos chapter 9, verse 14, and Zechariah chapter 8, verses 4 to 8. 
And they also believed this would be a time when the nations would be judged, according to Amos chapter one. Their hope was kindled and dashed repeatedly throughout their post United Kingdom history. In other words, the hope was high that the maybe now was the kingdom. No, it wasn't. And yes, it was. And you know, it kept going up and down throughout history as they waited for the appearance of the kingdom. And so from Zerubbabel, uh, who led the first wave of exiles back to Jerusalem from uh, Babylonian captivity to the Maccabean, uh, Maccabean revolt, which took place you know, between Malachi and John, you know, intertestamental period, uh, there was the Maccabean revolt. You know, from these two big events, the hope of the Jewish people was for a kingdom of this world peopled by Jews. In other words, their kingdom was a dream of Jewish nationalism, where they would be on top, they would control, they would go back to the glory days. So that was the Davidic concept of the kingdom. Okay? Some people were waiting for this type of kingdom to appear. Then uh, during the uh, intertestamental period, remember I, I, I said between Malachi and John the Baptist, there, there were no prophets, no inspired writings during this time. That's why we call it the intertestamental period between 400 BC and 6 AD. During this period, another view of the kingdom began to develop among non-inspired writings of that time. And we refer to these writings as apocalyptic literature. The writers of this era hoped for a heavenly kingdom which would end the present evil age. In the book of Jubilee, for example, a non-inspired book, but a book that talks about these things, the author suggests a golden age to come in which God himself would usher in his kingdom, reversing the evils of Satan. And so these and various combination of these ideas were swirling about in the minds of the people as John the Baptist began to speak about the kingdom, and it's only, it's only natural. I mean, you know, they have prophets, you know, uh, generation after generation, they have prophets leading the people, encouraging them to wait for this, this time when the kingdom would arrive, you know, and then all of a sudden there's nothing, you know, intertestamental period, there's nothing for centuries. Well, you know, there's a vacuum there. And so <laughs> other writers stepped into the vacuum and, and began writing about what might happen. Although they were non-inspired writings, they did have an effect on the people and what the people thought the kingdom would be like. So we can understand therefore that when the people heard Jesus teach that the kingdom had arrived, that was one thing, but then they witnessed his powerful miracles. Well, they were ready to crown him king and by force if necessary. We read about that in John chapter six, verse 15. I'm just trying to get across to you the idea that there was a, a palpable excitement about something great that was going to happen. And then when Jesus arrives and starts doing the miracles, of course, you know, people are thinking, this is it, finally. But Jesus started to describe the kingdom in detail. And, and his description did not fit any of the notions that the writers or the people had of the kingdom. In addition to this, he described the kingdom in abstract terms with the use of parables, uh, without reference to political or military or economic features, which was what they were thinking. He said, for example, that the kingdom was like a mustard seed, or the kingdom was like a man who sowed seed, or a leaven that leavens dough, or a net that catches fish, or a relationship between master and servant, or a person that finds a pearl or, or a treasure and sells everything he has in order to you know, gain possession of that, of that pearl. So true to Daniel's words, Jesus begins to teach the people that the kingdom is supernatural in nature and not political. And a lot of people, you know, they weren't buying into that, okay? So the kingdom, Jesus says, is not of this world. That was the kingdom, not of this world. This didn't mean that the kingdom had no power or authority. It simply meant that 
as a spiritual kingdom, its power and authority were derived and controlled by God, not armies, not human rulers. And so the kingdom that Jesus and his apostles announced was one that was small enough to exist in the heart of the individual. However, it was big enough to include all who would enter in. This kingdom was powerful enough to dominate every other kingdom and was so precious that when someone found it, they would abandon everything they owned in order to possess it. And yet uh, it was so elusive that some people stood right next to it, but they never saw it. So finally, the, the kingdom that Jesus spoke of was being built in their lifetimes, exactly as Daniel had spoken. So a couple of things that we've learned about the kingdom so far. First, the kingdom was a subject of prophecy. Secondly, the kingdom was spiritual in nature and not physical in nature. A third point about the kingdom, the kingdom has been established. Now, it's very important because this is still a, a question of debate today. Uh, many years ago, I had a friend who worked in Saudi Arabia for several years. And when I would write to him, um, uh, part of his address read Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That actually, I had to write that down on the envelope. And so the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia includes all the territory over which the King of Saudi Arabia rules. And throughout history, this has been different according to how much land the King obtained through wars and negotiations and so on and so forth. The point here is that a kingdom is that which belongs to a king. This is the earthly physical understanding of the term kingdom. Now in Matthew chapter six, verse nine and 10, Jesus says the following in that prayer. He says, pray then in this way, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now in this passage, Jesus mentions one kingdom, but two uh, different spheres, one on earth that had yet to be established and one in heaven that was already established. Therefore, Jesus was praying that the will of God be done on earth as it was already being done in heaven. Now, an important point to note here is that the kingdom of God exists wherever his will is being done. As a matter of fact, the word kingdom comes from the Greek word meaning sovereignty or will. In Matthew 6, 9 and 10, therefore, Jesus is praying that God's will be done here on earth and thus establish his kingdom, just as God's will is now being done in heaven. And when this happens, God's will will be done and the kingdom will be established in both the heavenly and the earthly realms. That's what Jesus' prayer was about. Your will be done in heaven as it, is, uh, as it is in heaven on earth. Your will's already being done in heaven, meaning your kingdom is there. The kingdom of heaven in heaven is there. His prayer that just as it is there in heaven, uh, he prays that it will also be established here uh, on earth. Uh, let's see. Uh, now, if we want to know what the kingdom looks like, we need to examine what God's will is for all men because the kingdom exists wherever God's will is being done. So what does that look like? So we read in Matthew, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse three to six, Paul writes, this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, our Savior, uh, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I stopped there. Notice what he says, God, who, des who desires? Well, God. God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. So what is God's will? God's will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, as, the son of, as the son of God. Uh, as Paul writes, God's will is that every man, every woman, 
recognize the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and they will be saved as a result. That's God's will. That's the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom is established every time someone recognizes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Insofar as the kingdom is concerned, it is being established whenever and wherever people are confessing Christ and expressing this faith in repentance and baptism, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The kingdom of God on earth is being established and grown. Now, doesn't this knowledge unlock all of the parables about the kingdom? I mean, if we understand that the, 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 that the kingdom is God's will being established and God's will is that all men believe in Jesus Christ, doesn't that make sense when you read the parables? Isn't Jesus the pearl of great price? And are we not willing to abandon everything in order to have him? Isn't the word of God the leaven that permeates the entire life of a man or a woman? Isn't preaching the gospel a great net that draws in many hearers that are eventually reduced to just a few believers? Isn't Jesus the master that leaves his disciples to care for the kingdom and will return one day to examine their stewardship? Isn't the knowledge of God's will small enough to exist in a believer's heart and yet big enough to reach every soul in the world? Isn't God's power powerful enough to destroy every human kingdom while sustaining his own kingdom to the end of time and beyond? You know, brothers and sisters, we're not premillennialists who are waiting for the kingdom to come, nor are we postmillennialists who think much like the Jews of the first century, that the kingdom will be a golden age where the church will dominate the earth until Jesus returns. That's not how we think. Our view is much simpler to understand and taken primarily from the previously quoted Matthew 10 verses six to nine where Jesus prays that God's will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. So when seen through the lens of the kingdom, we understand that all who are in heaven are obviously under the authority and will of God. And so the kingdom of God is firmly established in heaven. Jesus' prayer is that God's will, that is man's salvation through Christ, God's will also be established here on earth as well. So when someone asks when or how was God's kingdom established here on earth, your reply according to scripture should be, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ was established when the gospel began to be preached and people responded to it in faithful uh, obedience. So, uh, uh, the kingdom of God in heaven is established when the gospel uh, is preached. Every time someone confesses Christ and is immersed in water in his name for the forgiveness of sins and he receives the spirit, uh, the kingdom is established in that place. And if there are many such people in that place, then the, the kingdom is expanded by one more, one more soul. Now, to be more specific, the kingdom was established when Christ defeated sin and death with his resurrection to accomplish the first part of God's will. And that is to provide redemption for man's sins through the sacrifice of his son. And the doors to the kingdom were flung open as the apostles were first to enter in. And then on Pentecost Sunday, they began to preach the gospel to invite everyone who believed to also enter into the kingdom of God. And let's, let's read a, a familiar uh, passage, uh, shall we, uh, concerning uh, the moment when the doors were open and the people began to flock into the kingdom. Peter says, or Luke actually writes that Peter is saying, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? 
Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 uh, about 3,000 souls. Another passage here. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And notice he says that in that day, 3,000 souls were added. You ever ask yourself, they were added to what? What were they added to? Well, they were added to the kingdom. That's how you add to the kingdom. Whenever someone is converted, whenever someone confesses Christ and is baptized, they're added to the kingdom. You can say they were added to the church. Those words are interchangeable. And so as Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, but as we have learned, it is very much in this world and embodied by those who have been added to it through faith in Jesus expressed uh, in repentance and baptism. Okay, one other thing here we want to talk about the kingdom and that is the growth of the kingdom and its development. So far we have seen how and when the kingdom was established. Next, we need to examine how the kingdom grows because Jesus often spoke of its growth and development. So very briefly, Jesus spoke about the kingdom in two ways. One, as it relates to an individual. In other words, the kingdom of God within you. Jesus used the example of a seed or leaven referring to agents that worked on the inside of a person to cause change. These agents were figures representing God's word given through the Holy Spirit and recorded by the apostles. So the kingdom, that is the ability to do God's will and become Christ-like, the kingdom grows within the individual as he internalizes and submits to the direction of God's word. The growth of the kingdom within becomes evident externally as the kingdom dweller produces spiritual fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on and so forth. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 24. Paul calls it the fruit of the spirit, but we could just as easily call it the fruit of the kingdom. The people in the kingdom also produce fruit or the kingdom within the believer, same thing. So when you see these things, developed in one's life in the name of Christ, what you are seeing is the kingdom that is not of this world living within a believer who happens to be in this world, all right? Now, the other way Jesus referred to uh, the kingdom was in a collective sense. Jesus, the apostles, and other New Testament writers used different words when referring to the kingdom collectively. Uh, many people, uh, when we say collectively, we mean when many people uh, who have been converted are together, all right? Uh, they use terms like the church or the saints or the household of God, many different terms, but all meaning the same thing. This collective kingdom grows in numbers and spiritual influence on the world as it spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And so, this kingdom of God on earth is made up of individuals who have and continue to respond to God's will in Christ. Individually, they are called Christians or saints or disciples or believers, to name a few. Collectively, they are referred to as the church or the body of Christ, among other terms. So if, if you've obeyed God's will in believing and obeying Christ, the kingdom in the form of the Holy Spirit and the word of God are in you as an individual. And at the same time, you as an individual become part of the kingdom of God comprised of all those who have been saved both in heaven and on earth. All right, one more thing I want to say about the kingdom and that is the glorification of the kingdom. The apostles 
had a, hand, uh, had a hard time understanding the nature of the kingdom uh, to the extent where they never even asked the obvious, uh, the obvious question, what is the purpose of the kingdom? Why was it formed? What is all this leading to? Well, in my lesson, I've, I've been talking about the kingdom of heaven here on earth, but I haven't really discussed the kingdom of heaven on earth. An important point to remember in all of this is that if we are part of the kingdom here on earth, it means that we will also participate in the kingdom of heaven that is in heaven. And we should be grateful for that. The kingdom uh, here on earth is the kingdom. However, it is not yet a glorified and exalted kingdom. This is the end game. This is the purpose of our faith. The kingdom of heaven in heaven is glorified and those who are part of it have things that we do not have. Things that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 49, where he describes the features of the glorified body. Things like incorruptibility, meaning no sin or no weakness of the flesh, or excuse me, no sin or weaknesses that were present in the flesh previously. Um, supernatural power, in other words, uh, not being subject to time or, or natural laws. Um, uh, eternal existence, no death, uh, and spiritual glory. In other words, spiritual gifts perfected to the point where they are a source of light emanating uh, from within. And so the glorified state will enable us to become like Christ in power as well as personality and righteousness. This is the reward for the faithful. We become like Christ in more ways than one. The return of Jesus at the end of the world will signal the joining together of the kingdom of God on earth with the kingdom of God in heaven. And together with the angels and Jesus himself, all will be united within the Godhead to exist in this way uh, for an eternity. Imagine uh, the ultimate goal, the, the, the ultimate end, the final product, if you wish, of, of, our, of our life in Christ and our faithfulness is that we will eventually participate in the Godhead as part of the Godhead through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, let's just summarize. I know there's been a lot for the first lesson here. We've, we've I've tried to squeeze, squeeze in as much as, uh, as possible. Uh, so let's just summarize very quickly, shall we? First of all, the kingdom of God here on earth. Daniel, the prophet, predicted it. Uh, Jesus proclaimed and died for it. The apostles opened its doors with their preaching. Uh, people have entered in through faith expressed in obedience. And we all await the return of Jesus for its glorification and its final eternal exaltation. However, in the meantime, I want to remind you of one thing and then this lesson is yours. One thing to remember while we're here on earth, dealing with all the things we have to deal with here on earth. I want you to remember that you, you are the kingdom in this world, not these guys. Doesn't matter how many people show up, doesn't matter the fanfare, doesn't matter the noise, doesn't matter you know, the idols and all that kind of stuff. You're the ones uh, who are the kingdom. Let this be a comfort to you when personally you feel weak or, or dry spiritually. Remember, you're the kingdom. You are part of the kingdom here on earth, not these guys. Let this be a comfort to you and your church when it seems that there's no progress taking place or the progress is not very fast. Remember, you are the kingdom in this world, not these guys. And because this is so, you may be reduced and discouraged and unsure, but you cannot be defeated because you, you are the kingdom in this world, not these guys. So let this be a motivation to persevere and invest and launch out and speak up and proclaim and repent and then try again because you are the kingdom in this place. It's you who are the kingdom. 
When you're in one city, you're, in, you're the kingdom in that city. When you're in one home, you're the kingdom in that home. You, we need to realize that we are members of the kingdom always and forever, forevermore. So I pray that God bless you as you build up the kingdom of Christ and, and as you wait patiently uh, for his return. All right, well, that's the material for this first lesson. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, read uh, Matthew uh, chapters five, six, and seven for our next lesson, because we're going to be talking about life in the kingdom. Today's lesson was simply, you know, what is the kingdom and where did it come from? And you know, kind of some general information about making us familiar with the idea of the kingdom of God. Next lesson, we're going to talk about uh, real life, you know, what is life like for those who live in the kingdom? Okay, that's our lesson. Thank you very much for your attention.